Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're delighted that you could join us this week as we continue our journey through the book of Ephesians. We are looking at Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, pulling it apart, pulling it back together, and seeing what it means to you and me in our lives today. This week we are on lesson number 13 with an interesting title, Waging Peace. We're going to find out what that's about in just a moment. But before we delve into this week's lesson, let's begin with prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the journey that you have taken us on thus far in the book of Ephesians. We ask that this week you will help us to better understand Paul's exhortations to us, his encouragement for us, and the hope that we have in Jesus. We ask that you'll bless our time together this week, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our guest this week, as he has been throughout this quarter, is Dr. John McVeigh. He's the president of Walla Walla University. John, welcome back once again. Good to be back with you. So we're almost to the end. Week 13, we've got one more to go. Week 13, second week studying what is arguably the greatest passage in the New Testament on the cosmic conflict or the great controversy at least as it has to do with our behavior as Christian disciples. That's right, and we're gonna pull that apart this week, waging peace. Now, when we take a look at this week's lesson, let's, let's kind of review a little bit of, of what we've looked at before last week. There's this armor of God that Paul talks about. Walk us through that, that'll help us get ready for where we're going this sure. week. So you'll remember from last week that Paul issues this repeatedly this call to be strong in the Lord uh, early on in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Uh, last week we spent most of, much of our time with verses 10 through 13, uh, and he talks about these authorities, these, these rulers and authorities and cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, so we know something about our foe, right? And uh, now he's, he's going to go back through all of that, but he's going to do it in a detailed image. And if you really look at how he does this, he portrays the Christian disciple donning various implements of war, various pieces of armor and various weapons. He, he imagines that happening in much the same order that a Roman legionnaire might put those things on. And he assigns various names to various pieces of the implements of a Christian soldier's uh, armor, doesn't he? He does. Yeah. So let's kind of walk through there. He says in verse number 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth and putting on the breastplate of righteousness. He goes on from there, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, then taking the shield of faith, which which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So elements of, of armor, some defensive, some offensive. It's, it's kind of an all-encompassing mm -hmm. attire that he pictures sure. here. Yeah, it is. And it's in, in Greek, the term is panoplion, which is the complete armor of God. So it's not just armor. It's, it's the, it's the head-to-toe uh, protection that God provides for Christian disciples as they engage in the cosmic conflict. And, and these, are, these are significant and important, aren't they? Very significant. Yeah. Now a question might, uh, might arise about these different elements of the armor that we are supposed to put on. Are these, are these human virtues? Are these divine gifts? How do we see these different portions or pieces of the armor? Well, Bible students do argue about that, uh, about that point, and I'm going to fudge it, Eric, and say they're, they're kind of both. They're kind of both. I, I, if you have to say which are they primarily, I think primarily these are the gifts of God to the Christian disciple. So this is God's truth, the, the belt of truth, belt on truth. So the, the, the belt as part of the Roman uh, military man's uh, equipment played a little different role than the belt you put on probably this morning. It was this fairly massive piece uh, that, that helped them gird up their loins. You know, you, you tucked stuff in all around it. You, you got ready for battle. And from it hung uh, pieces of thick leather that actually formed part of the armor and helped protect the soldiers. So you had this, this, this belt. 
And Paul envisions it, uses it as an image for God's truth, which he grants to Christian disciples, the truth of the gospel that he's been discussing throughout the epistle to the Ephesians. Uh, so Paul is really portraying the Christians, tra the transformation of pagan believers into Christians by imagining them donning these pieces of armor. This is how they are transformed. It's a little bit like putting on the old man and putting on the new man back that we saw back in chapter 4. And so they're putting on these, these different implements. But they don't so much possess God's truth as God's truth possesses them, right? And we can kind of do this with each of these implements. It, these, are, these are more God's gift to, uh, gifts to us that protect us and enable our Christian witness than they are our own virtues that are our own individual virtues. Uh, but, and, and I think this, this is important, um, Paul is trying to activate them and to say these aren't just abstract gifts of God that you set on the, on the shelf, but you need to live into these. You need to live into this truth. You need to live into this battle. You need to, you need to live into the gospel of peace and, and so on. So it's both, in a way, virtue, but principally gifts, assets that God provides us with which he equips us as soldiers in the great controversy. So he's giving us these things, but I guess one might say we have to choose to put them on. We can't just look at them and go, there they are. Exactly. We have to, exactly. I don't know if I'm comfortable with the word own, but we have to right. embrace these gifts yes. and, and put them into use, put them into practice. Right. And, and one would expect that the more we embrace them and the more we put them into practice, the more perhaps comfortable we'll feel in that sure. armor and it will become a natural extension of who we are in our lives, Sure, which is uh, encouraging. We can talk about each of these uh, pieces of, of armor, but let me, let, let's touch together on a couple of them. Uh, the shoes. As shoes for your feet, put on what will give the readiness to proclaim the gospel of peace. Now, I think that's a really key mention here because I think Paul controls his metaphor by that phrase. Uh, we might read this and say, oh, Paul's talking about actual combat. And we might remember that 30 years ago, there was a group of people in Waco who stocked up arms and read the prophecies and imagined participating in actual combat. What a sad story that is. And, and Paul warns us away from misreading his powerful high testosterone <laughs> image here. Uh, he, he guards us from that by saying what we're really about is the gospel of peace. So he kind of deconstructs his own metaphor and that's led someone to say that what Paul's talking about here isn't waging armed actual combat. It's about the church waging peace. But what it does help us capture is the churches, the, the investment of Christian disciples, the zealous engagement and investment of Christian disciples. We're not just sentries uh, standing off somewhere at a corner of the battlefield watching it unfold. We are fully engaged, throwing ourselves into this battle, which is waging peace. So the, uh, the army is not that group over <laughs> there. The army is a group of which I am a part. Yes, exactly. And, and my calling is to, to wage this peace with right. others. As you've mentioned in, in the book of Ephesians, Paul is trying to, to strive for unity mm -hmm. and, and using us to bring about that unity too. And throughout the letter, he's been discussing the strategies of Christian disciples. He's been thinking about the great controversy throughout this letter. We see hints of that going on as we've seen. And interesting to read, say, the end of chapter 4, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So that's not the kind of war, you know. He's actually setting those things aside. And the strange weapons for this Christian army are be kind to one another, <laughs> tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. These are the kind, they're, they're strange battles, they're strange weapons or an actual army, but they're just the ticket for the militia of Christ. For, for a group that is called to wage peace. Yes. And that's, that's a fantastic picture there. John, there's several, um, several commands that 
Paul gives as we move through this section. And I want to kind of start digging into those before our break. We'll come back and, and do a little bit more. But what are some of the, the big commands that we see Paul give to the church here in Ephesians 6? Well, I like to distill this passage into four commands because they're kind of easy to remember and, and it, it helps embed this passage in my mind. So the first one, for example, would be follow the leader. And when I say this passage, I'm taking the whole passage now, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. And we see this happening, at uh, Paul underlining this command early on. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That's how he starts the passage, right? In other words, follow the, follow the leader. So it's as though Paul sees himself as a general. And he's stepping onto the battlefield on the eve of battle. And he's given a big speech and he's conveying the orders of the commander-in-chief who calls us to battle and promises to be with us in the fight. And so in those early verses there, he's, he's really giving us that command deep in our hearts and souls, follow the leader. It's a good, strong command, isn't it? So that's a, a great place to start. What about the second command? The second command, I, I would say, is encapsulated in oh, verse 12 especially, and that is know the foe. He wants us to avoid underestimating our enemy. We don't want to do that. We have to have a realistic assessment of our foe. And he says, you're not just up against flesh and blood. You're up against spiritual forces of darkness. You're, you're up against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers. You're up against all of that. He wants us to have a realistic assessment of what we're up against. And if you move down the passage, he wants to remind us that those forces of darkness are, are led by a wily devil. And so we're up against it. He wants us to have a, a realistic as assessment of our foe. So second command, know the foe. So we've got follow the leader <clears throat> is the first command. Second command, know the foe. And we're going to be looking at the third and fourth commands when we come back in just a moment. I want to encourage you, time is running out. We're on week 13 of 14. If you don't yet have the companion book to this quarter's Sabbath school lesson, be sure to pick it up very soon. It is called Ephesians by John McVeigh. It's the companion to this quarter's lesson. You can find it at itiswritten.shop. Again, that's itiswritten.shop. We're going to come back in just a moment as we continue looking at week number 13. We're looking at two more commands that Paul gives us, and we're going to tie together this thought of waging peace. We'll be right back. It's a land rich with culture. Colorful bazaars, stunning mosques, and ancient ruins now occupy the same territory once conquered by the Persian, Greek, and Roman empires. In the midst of this tumultuous history, followers of Christ began to form their first churches. One of these churches was instructed by Jesus to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. What were the believers in Sardis missing? And how is this letter to a church that existed 2,000 years ago relevant to the church today? Find out by watching The Seven Churches of Revelation Sardis, and learn what it means to truly overcome. The Seven Churches of Revelation, Sardis, brought to you by It Is Written TV. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about the study of the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious about God's Word also. Well, I want to share with you another way that you can dig deeper into the Word of God. And here it is, itiswritten.study. Go online to itiswritten.study and you can access the It Is Written Bible Study Guides, 25 in-depth Bible studies that will walk you through the Bible. It's going to be good for you and it's the sort of thing that you will want to tell somebody else about so that they can dig deeper into the Word of God and come to know the things of the Bible intimately. As you get into the It Is Written online Bible study guides, you'll understand the prophecies of the Bible, the plan of salvation, and more. So don't forget, itiswritten.study. Itiswritten.study.
Welcome back to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We are continuing to look at lesson number 13, Waging Peace. And John, we've looked at two of the four commands that Paul gives us already. Follow the leader and know the foe. Both very, sure. very important. But yes. he doesn't just give us those two. He gives us at least two more. What are the other two? Yeah, the third one would be join the army. Now, it's really interesting, Eric, as you look at the way our passage has been understood down through Christian history, most of the ink has been spilled on a very individualistic understanding of the passage. I am the lone Christian soldier battling against evil. And there's been a lot of ink spilled. Uh, there's a, a gentleman back in the 17th century, William Gurnall, who preached a bunch of sermons on this passage and wrote three volumes totaling more than 800,000 words and 1,500 pages. So down through time, there's a lot of literature on this passage. Much of it sort of assumes that Paul is addressing the individual Christian warrior. But that would be really quite strange, wouldn't it, in a letter, as we have seen, that focuses so much attention on the church, to talk about church, 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 and then end the letter with a portrait of a single individual would seem pretty strange to me. It would. It would and be very inconsistent. Very inconsistent. So it seems to me that we, we understand this to be Paul's final metaphor for the church, his final image for the church, as an army. Uh, this is a call to arms. This is a call to the church militant. Importantly, as we've just talked about, not waging any conventional war, but waging peace. But we need each other just as much as those soldiers in actual combat need each other. We, we need one another. So the third call would be simply to, to join the army. Join the army. The church, says Paul, is a well-equipped fighting force, a united army engaged in the long-running battle of the great controversy. And just as others in conventional battle need one another, we need each other. In fact, I like to think that if we view the passage that way, and there are all sorts of hints that we should do so, if we view the passage that way, there's a secret weapon buried in the passage, and that's Christian, Christian camaraderie and esprit de corps. And that makes sense in a letter which is about unity, right? And Paul here goes after his theme of unity all things being united in Christ, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, one more time under the image of the need for a united, fit, fighting army waging peace. So we've got one more command here that Paul gives us. Yep. And, and this, is, uh, this is a rather important one. We've touched on it a bit earlier, but uh, uh, it would be fight to the finish. Fight to the finish. Uh, I, I do believe this is a high testosterone image in which Paul is one of his great goals or objectives in finishing his letter this way is to activate us, to energize us to zealous participation in the cosmic conflict as soldiers of the cross. So he doesn't want us to just relax in the chase lounge watching others fight the battle. He's recruiting us into the army of Christ. He's wanting us to be active. We've talked a little bit about that command to stand that is used four times here, and the fact that that command to stand doesn't mean to stand as a sentry not fighting. It refers to the moment when two phalanxes would meet, and at that moment when you're meeting that opposing army, what you have to do is dig those hobnail boots in and pr push your your push your, the, the, the boss of your shield forward and stand in battle. So it's not, a, it's not a quietistic, passive stance that he's looking for. He's saying to us, you're in, you're in this battle, and you need to be all in this battle. Fight to the finish. And yet, in all of that is this idea of waging peace. Yes. So he, yes. he takes those two seemingly opposed ideas and melds them beautifully together here. It's a vigorous military metaphor, but he gives us enough hints and clues along the way that we know how to apply this. This is not conventional war, but this is zealous engagement in the cosmic conflict, zealous engagement in waging peace. Very powerful. John, I want to read a, a quote here 
and have you respond to it. This comes from a book called Testimonies to Ministers on page number 22, and here's what it says. When men arise claiming to have a message from God, but instead of warring against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, they form a hollow square and turn the weapons of warfare against the church militant. Be afraid of them. They do not bear the divine credentials. God has not given them any such burden of labor. That's a rather interesting uh, passage. It the, is. the word friendly fire comes to mind. Yes, it, yes, it does. Your thoughts on that? Well, again, to know the foe, our, our second command, right, is to be able to identify who's your enemy and who's your friend. And, and Paul is really concerned that we not misidentify each other as the enemies in this conflict. Uh, in fact, in the truest sense, our enemies are not in human form, right? If you're fighting the battle of the great controversy, or you think you're fighting the battle of the great controversy, and you're fighting against human beings, you haven't fully understood Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 20. You haven't understood that your foe really are the supernatural powers of darkness. So friendly fire is not something we want to have happen. That is, we do not want to damage fellow combatants, fellow disciples in the cosmic conflict. We want our, the force of our waging of peace to go against uh, those supernatural forces of darkness. Very powerful. So one thing that doesn't jump out at us in this, this depiction of the armor of God is prayer. How does that figure into all of this? I'm going to make the assumption that it does. Sure, sure. Because prayer is, is yeah. part of Christian warfare, as it were. But how do we see that fit in here? Well, verses 18 through 20 is, is Paul's call to prayer. Some, some Bible scholars see this as separate from the armament passage. They see the armament passage as only chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. However, as I've studied uh, ancient battle literature to try to understand Paul's imagery here, because he seems to be very much drawing on the tradition of Greek and Roman warfare as he, as he shares this image of the church. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed by how often soldiers are portrayed as praying. And so while I don't think it's it's given to us here or portrayed here as a separate weapon. It is part of the battlefield context. So a soldier gets all suited up, ready to go to the fray, ready to, ready to enter the fray. He knows, he knows all of the difficult things that are going to happen out there on that battlefield. He's, he's mentally trying to get prepared for that. The next thing that that soldier will do often in ancient battle literature is pray. Now he's praying to the gods, plural, right here. But Paul wants us to pray with him and about him to God, capital G, to the one true God, to Jesus Christ. He wants us to pray to God. And, and so I think this is part of his battlefield setting that he's painting for us here. So prayer, very, very significant. John, there's one other section in here that I think is important to, to tease out a little bit. And that's what Paul refers to in verse number 20. He says, I am an ambassador in chains. What does he mean when he says that he is an ambassador in chains? What's that all about? Well, if you, if you look at the, the context here, he seems to be looking toward an event, doesn't he? He says, he asks them to pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. And he seems to be looking toward that tete-a-tete, head-to-head conversation that he will have with none other than Emperor Nero. Okay, so he's looking toward that, and he's saying, I know that's coming. Please pray for me that in that moment I won't quail or turn tail and run in the battle, but that I will stand firm and proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So please pray for me. And then he says, I am the ambassador in chains. Well, he's imprisoned, remember. Paul is a prison. This is one of the prison epistles. So he's referring to the chains of his imprisonment. But there may be some spicing of irony here, Eric, in that ambassadors wore a chain of office. And so there may be a kind of double entendre going on here in this mention where he's saying these chains actually signifies something far more important 
that I am the personal ambassador of the risen Christ who sits on the throne of the cosmos. Nero is almost meaningless <laughs> when compared to the power and the glory of the one that I serve. So the chains that may have been visible on him were not nearly as powerful as the invisible chains of office that he was also wearing. Very nice way to put it. Very yes. powerful. Mm -hmm. So John, there may be somebody who's watching this right now, listening to it right now, who's looking at their own life and trying to figure out how they fit into this big picture. They may mm -hmm. not feel that they have the strongest shield, their belt may not feel as, as wide and hefty sure. as others, and they don't quite know how they fit into this larger army, as it were. They feel a little bit alone. How would yeah. you encourage them and help them to see that, that Christ has a message for them in this, this metaphor of a soldier? Well, I might go to one piece of, of uh, armor that we haven't mentioned here much, Eric, and that's the helmet of salvation, as it's usually called. The term that's used there for, that's translated salvation, is probably better translated in a, in a battle context as the helmet of victory, the victory helmet, the parade helmet. And New Testament scholars used to say, well, did such things even exist? But in recent years, archaeologists have discovered these beautiful parade helmets that you would never wear in battle lest it get damaged. Beautiful, the Halliton helmet in, from the UK, discovered in a UK bog, for example. This gorgeous, gorgeous adorned helmet. And so uh, Paul is saying, if that's correct, that it's the helmet of victory, the parade helmet, he's saying, enter the fray, enter the battle with the parade helmet on because you know that God is provisioning you with victory. You know that you have all the resources you need. The, the victory is certain, it is promised. And so I would say to that hesitant disciple or hesitant soldier that, that this is far more about God than it is about you. This is about what God intends in Christ to do in you and for you and through you. You can trust yourself in God's hands. I seem to remember a passage in the Bible that says something about the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's, amen. And that's encouraging for all of us, or at least it certainly should be. I trust and pray that this week's lesson has been a blessing to you. We have one more week left, lesson number 14 next week, and we look forward to seeing you back again then. This has been Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written.